I got a question. So when it comes to fees, is there a limit on the fees that you can charge tenants for like, like late fees or anything like that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Let, let, let me wait till, till everybody's seated. I'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things, one of the things that, that, that I, I tell landlords all the time is don't let tenants off the hook when it comes to fees. Um, there is a limit though. Uh, recently, the Texas legislature passed a, a limit on late fees. So if you have a multifamily unit, which is over four units uh, in, in a given structure, so five or more, you're capped at 10%. If it's a single family home, you can charge 12% in your late fee. Simple math. You have $1,000 per month rent. Your top late fee for a rental is $120. You cannot exceed $120. If you do, you're technically holding money for next month's rent. Right? Uh, now, th there is a caveat that says if your actual expenses exceed either 10 or 12 percent, you can charge more. But you better be able to prove that to a court, right? So, for example, let's say you hire one of those filthy uh, landlord tenant attorneys to write you a letter of collection, and he charges you 150 bucks for this $1,000 a month unit. And he sends it out, and sure enough, the client pays. Well, you can charge them that $150 collection fee, which you had to incur only because they were late. But unless you can justify more than 10 or 12%, respectively, you can't do it. You just can't do it. So let, let's, let's take a look at this list. I want to talk about 10 do's and 10 don'ts that I prep for you guys um, based on my experience. The first one is to do a, a proper screening. So many landlords fail right here, right before they ever hand over keys because they don't screen their tenants. If you are doing a good job as a landlord, it's because you are screening everybody properly. And I don't know how many times I've heard landlords say, man, I got this bad feeling right at the start, but I, I, I rented to them anyway, and now I'm in a mess. I haven't received rent for five months, and now I need your help. Uh, Mr. Attorney, help me out. And so what I do say is make sure, just like Marvel taught us, Trust your spidey sense. If you get a bad feeling, go with your gut. I mean, it, it's there for a reason. You want to be able to say, you know what? I did everything I did, I, I could do to determine this is a good, a good tenant for me. Number two, do talk about animals. Everybody loves animals, just about. Well, a lot of people like animals, right? Most people. But we don't talk about them properly. We don't talk about them properly. Because sometimes you ask, as a landlord, do you have any pets? And they say, no, I don't have a single pet. And then three months in, you find out they've got an emotional support armadillo. <laughs> and you're like, hey, whoa, you said you didn't have any pets. And I don't. Well, what's that thing you're holding? Well, this is my emotional support armadillo which is protected by federal law. Federal law protects me. I don't have to pay a pet deposit. I don't, and you can't deny me a rental because I have an emotional support animal. If you're not asking about animals, you're not asking the right question. And if someone claims to have an emotional support animal and you're not seeking some kind of justification, you might have somebody pulling the wool over your eyes. Question, uh, what yeah. about if it's a service animal or like somebody that's like uh, that's a blind person then? Well see a service animal is gonna come with two very obvious details. First if you can't tell that your tenant is blind, you're just not paying attention, right? So if their, if their disability is open and obvious, easy. Blindness is that, paralysis is that, but emotional things are not open and obvious. So when it's open and obvious, very easy. 
a seeing eye dog. They got a cane and a dog and a little patch on his side. Easy. The problem comes when it's not so easy. What do they say? I have this dog because he detects my seizures. I'm an epileptic. Well, you can't tell epilepsy just by looking at somebody. But you can, if it's not open and obvious, request doc medical documentation from a professional in the medical field to prove that they meet that threshold. Are you allowed? You are allowed because it's not open and obvious. I could say I'm epileptic. You couldn't tell just by looking at me. Right. And so it's okay if I claim that for you, the landlord, to say, well, if I could just get something from your doctor establishing your medical need and something from somebody corroborating the fact that your animal does what you say he does. Because again, just because, well, I've trained him to check my epilepsy for me. For sure, a doctor has to die now. Oh, I don't know about a doctor on the, on the dog. For pets or animals, there really isn't a, a set standard yet. This is a brand new, this is brand new stuff. And so there isn't like uh, a medical board set up for this. There isn't a state agency set up for this yet. So if their doctor says yes, and they get something that looks legitimate, you cannot say no. You cannot turn them away, and you cannot charge them additional fees. But you want to have this conversation before you hand over keys, not three months in. Get it done before, because if it's a little bit shady, you can turn them down and say, you are not the most qualified applicant. I went with a more qualified applicant. Okay? How do you do that? Without having to say, I denied you because of your emotional support or your service animal. You never want to say that, right? That should not be the reason. All right. Uh, do sign a written lease uh, and don't settle for month to month unless you are using your month to month lease strategically. Don't just settle for it. Every lease comes to an end. They all do. And sometimes the landlord says, oh, well, I've had them for three years, but we haven't signed a lease since 2020. And my question is, why not? You're, you're living 30 days at a time. You can lock them in for 12 months or lock them out and move on to somebody else. You're not raising your rents at a time when rent should be raised, right? The market calls for that and you're not doing it because you don't know how to do it or you're just not thinking, you're not thinking like a business person. So don't settle for a month to month. If you can lock in a good rate, lock it in. If you can lock in a good tenant, lock them in. If you can get rid of a bad tenant at the end of a lease, do that too. But don't settle for month to month and that maybe I'm in, maybe I'm out, that wishy-washy disposition is going to hurt you. So I have a question. Go ahead. So I have a tenant and they've been with me for a year. They're perfect, perfect renters, okay? And they recently asked me if they could go month to month because they're looking at buying a house. So I advocate for housing, right? So it only made sense to me to let them go month to month because they're looking to buy a house. They're not looking just because they're being wishy-washy on the lease. Is that a bad thing? So this is where you make a money decision. Number one, you can say, look, I am less secure because at any 30 day notice, I'm gonna lose what is a very good tenant. I'd rather lock you in for six months than put you on month to month. But as a shrewd business person, I'll meet you in the middle. I'll do a month to month. You pay X amount of additional rent every month. And now the deal makes sense, right? And so if, if you're making a business decision, it's based on risk and it's based on customer service. And you may tell yourself, these are the best tenants I've ever had. The least worry 
In fact, when they leave, the house is going to be in better condition. I'm going to do whatever I can to keep them, and that's fine. But remember, you're in this business to make money, and if the market says you could make here, and you're settling for here, you got to ask yourself, why am I funding that gap? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Landlords, as always, we welcome you to follow us on our Instagram page. If you're not a member yet, join us on Facebook. Uh, and if you enjoy what you see here, give us a thumbs up. Click that like button. We enjoy that very much. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. So, we all have one of these, right? Everybody know what this is? Use it. Be a good communicator with your tenants. If you are not communicating with your tenants, that's on you. Because the don't is, don't let them go MIA. You need to establish an open avenue to communicate with your tenants. Because number one, you need to know the condition of your property all the time. The worst thing that could happen is you get a tenant who's like, it's not that bad. And then two weeks later, it didn't get much worse. I have a and question. How often can you go visit the tenant? And do you have to get into the car when you're there? It depends on your lease. If you're using the Texas Realtors lease, which many of you have access to and many of you use, uh, it says if you're going to go inspect, you don't even need to give notice. You can go any time that is reasonable and peaceable. Now, you don't have to give me You are granted access by Section 14 in that lease. And if they deny it, that's a breach. If they say, whoa, hey, we, no, it's a deny. You're invading my, my privacy. You can't come in. I got little babies here. Uh, maybe, but the lease allows it. The lease gives you access, even unannounced. Now, as a customer service uh, gesture, I recommend you always give at least 24 hours notice. Not to ask permission. To simply state, I'm coming in. And so if you got a good, a good tenant who's been good the whole time, and they say, look, my grandma's coming. I haven't seen grandma in so long. I would prefer not to spend, you know, three hours of that with, you know, Julio who's gonna come in and, and do good work, work that we need. But can he come in like on Wednesday? Is that reasonable? I think it is. And if it doesn't harm you in any way, it doesn't cost you any money, it's good customer service, it's a good thing. But where you need to beware is for that tenant who says, no, you're not coming into my house unless I'm there and I want to see bonded and insured workers and I want to know the material they're using. It better be the best material that's available on the market. Uh, I, I, I don't know about all that. Uh, they don't call the shots. It's your property and you are held to a standard of diligence, not the gold plated standard, right? You don't gotta give double diamond service. You have to be diligent in your service. And so when it comes to, you know, communicating with your client or communicating with your tenant, part of that has to do with things like inspections. I recommend at least two go inside the house with a clipboard and a flashlight inspections per year. At the three month, if you're talking about one year lease, at the three month and at the nine month is what I recommend. Two per year. Because three months in, if you already start to see significant damage, that's a sign. These people gotta go. Nine months in, if the house, again, looks better than it did when they got it, that should be a little signal to you. I'm in love with these people, and I'm gonna do whatever I can in the next three months to convince them to sign another year lease, right? What about repairs? How fast can one I'm asking because I actually had a tenant who was um, the plumbing, plumbing was already plumbing, and they demanded so that's that's one of my uh, one of my later ones it says 
do this. Diligently respond to repair requests, especially 92.056 of the Texas Property Code says you are obligated when the defect on the premises affects, uh, materially affects the ordinary tenant, their health or their safety. And so there's a defect that materially affects their health and safety, you gotta act. Now the code doesn't say how quickly. That's a case by case situation. Let me tell you a story. I once had a, ten I once had a client who had a tenant who called him over the weekend and said, hey, uh, there's water coming in from the roof as a hole. And they said, look, it's the weekend. I can't get anybody over there till Monday. They recommended put a tarp up on the roof. You should be fine till Monday. Monday rolls around and the, the landlord goes to the property and checks it out. Turns out they called somebody. They called their primo over to get up on the roof and put uh, an emergency repair job up there. And it looked like utter garbage. They went, the landlord, tore all that out, redid everything, fixed it right. Two months later, they get served a notice. We want $750 for the repair we had to do on an emergency basis. And my client said, heck no. Then they got a lawsuit. And that's when I got hired. And we went to the court. Now, the lease said, you are not allowed to touch repairs. Only we can do repairs. The owner, the landlord. The landlord. What the judge didn't like were two things that my client said. Four minutes, number one. We get to the next session? Everyone number comes. one. They said, we could not get there until Monday. In the judge's opinion, the landlord needed to get there that day. Well, the, only the judge's opinion matters, and I guarantee that. I'm just telling you what the judge told me. And the judge said you should have been there that day because water was coming into their home. Now, they showed a picture, and that hole was about 12 inches across. We don't know when that hole got there. We don't know if that was from the rain or it was when their cousin went up and started doing the work. All we know is there was a 12 inch hole and the judge said, that's too much. That's an emergency. You needed to be there that day. The second thing my client said in testimony was, well, we didn't know what kind of workers they were using. They probably, and this is where things went bad. They probably hired a bunch of illegals. We don't know. And whoop, the judge stopped listening. Case was done. So, did it amount to an emergency that had to be addressed that same day? Maybe. I don't know. After that point, I couldn't, I couldn't squeeze a word in because the judge was red hot mad. Yep. Now, would it have helped if he had just showed up and be like, I can't fix it today? If he had acted with diligence in the eyes of the court, that's all that's required. He would have had a better chance. He would have had a better chance. And so if he had, if, if he had not, and, and he was mad too, the landlord was like frustrated. That does not help you. You want to be able to demonstrate to a court that you acted with diligence. The truth is, he should have just paid the 750 because it ended up costing him about three times that. Right? Uh, did he always follow my advice? No, he did not. Uh, and so, but if you follow my advice, it's going to work out much better for you. Act with diligence. Let your the tenant know. I'm doing everything I can to help you. Everything I can. I'm, I'm on the phone right now. Even if you can't get anybody, I'm on the phone right now. It makes a difference. Yes.